Good morning. Good morning. Please be seated. Welcome to Mayflower Congregational United Church of Christ, where we, we offer a warm welcome to seekers, doubters, believers, the born again, and those born just fine the first time. Here at Mayflower, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. They just wouldn't stop, Holy One. The thoughts of a thousand thoughts all seemed very urgent and pressing last night at 2 a.m. And they wouldn't stop, not at 2.15, not 17 minutes after that, not two minutes after that. Who knows when exhaustion finally won because everyone knows not to look at the clock after a while. It just makes it worse. There is so much to think about in the middle of the night. In any other circumstance, we might marvel at how much a brain can hold and imagine and worry about all at the same time. Unanswered emails, awkward exchanges, whether the kids are eating enough vegetables, whether we are eating enough vegetables, or maybe it's fruit no one is eating enough of, and that's how people get scurvy, like pirates. Piracy is a problem these days. It's been in the news. That's what we're thinking about now. Wait, why are we thinking about pirates when we haven't yet gone through every single failure from the last 10 years? I mean, there's still time. The alarm won't go off for another 45 minutes. Maybe if we were holier, this wouldn't be a problem. Holy people have no need for melatonin. Holy people probably sleep like a rock. But maybe not. After all, the psalmist wrote, I waited patiently for the Lord. The Lord inclined to me and heard my cry. And if they were actually asleep, the psalmist wouldn't have had to admit to waiting patiently. Sounds like the psalmist was also lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, hoping to go back to sleep. So if the author of a psalm struggled, maybe it's not that we aren't holy enough. It could be that we are just doing what Jesus warned us about when he said, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. So instead of worrying, Holy One, help us to wait patiently, to let go of what we don't need to hold on to anymore, and to trust that when the sun rises, we will get the chance to make amends, to be a blessing, to try again, for you are counting on it as much as we are. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter three, verses one through eight. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Here ends the reading from our tradition. May God grant to us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Good morning. Good morning. You do it too. (laughs) It happened in both services. I said good morning, you say good morning back. You know, in a lot of churches, not every church does that. (laughs) So it's good to be here this morning. And I begin as I do in every local church I am in, and that is with a word of thanks. Thank you for your ongoing partnership in ministry. There are many ways that we are partners, but I specifically want to thank you for your financial support of OCWM, our church's wider mission. Those are the dollars that make the ministry of the conference possible. 
They pay for some very basic things like the infrastructure that makes it possible for the conference to provide support to local congregations and pastors when they need it. Your dollars help support committees on ministry that oversee the pastors in our, con in our conference and that help congregations find local new church pastor leadership. Your OCWM dollars support the planning for communities of practice for pastors or stewardship seminars and it helps us with our, local, our work with uh, small congregations, mostly rural congregations, as we now encourage them to explore how they might become open and affirming congregations. Actually, anything that is the work of the conference is supported by your OCWM dollars. Part of your gifts to OCWM goes beyond the Kansas-Oklahoma Conference to the National UCC offices in Cleveland and supports an even wider witness of the United Church of Christ. And if you go to the UCC website, you will see the hundreds of ways your dollars are literally touching the lives of people you will never see or meet. Your dollars help support 290 global ministry partners in over 90 countries. Your dollars help support our UCC Washington office that leads our advocacy and policy work where the rubber hits the road because working for justice means changing systems, which means changing laws. And your dollars help support that advocacy work in DC. I could go on and on about the ways your OCWM dollars are used, but what I want you to hear most of all is thank you. Thank you for your support financially. And while our 2019 books are not numbers are not final, we show that we have received $10,727 from you in OCWM for, two, for 2019, just slightly less than we received in 2018. Thank you for your continued support. Your dollars truly are changing lives, not only here in Kansas and Oklahoma, but literally around the world. You know, in 2009, I promised myself I was not going to accept invitations to preach on Martin Luther King weekend anymore. <laughs> See, in 2009, Martin Luther King Sunday was just prior to the Tuesday that Barack Obama was inaugurated. The symbolic nature of that particular MLK weekend was so big, the pressure was huge on African American preachers to quote, knock it out of the park. That date to preach had been on my calendar for months, long before I or anyone else knew or put it together or even imagined what that weekend was going to be like. And there I was preaching on that very weekend, and I'm not even a real preacher. <laughs> I was in a good-sized congregation, and given the demographics of the UCC, I was the only African American in the church and I was in the pulpit in Sedona, Arizona on that momentous day. The sermon I am told was great, but then what were they going to say under the circumstances? <laughs> but the pressure was too great for me, so that was it. I made the promise never to preach on Martin Luther King Sunday again. I have kept that promise until now. <laughs> I am really fond of Lori Walkie. <laughs> and you know, sometimes you have to just suck it up and do your job. <laughs> And I am here this particular point, at this particular point, on this particular Sunday, not really because I am so fond of Lori, although I am, but because I am your conference minister. Most of you, in fact, the vast majority of you don't know me, and that's okay. That happens. But the important thing is, I know you. I am here this morning because you, because who you are and your ministry matters to me. It matters to this city, it matters to the conference and the wider United Church of Christ. 
So I make it my business to know you. And I sat among you two weeks ago. I listened carefully to Robin's last sermon and his words to you. I was with you, but not in the same place as you were, because I am, of course, more separate, a bit more objective. And as I listened to Robin and I looked around the congregation, the words from Ecclesiastes came to me, for everything there is a season. I have used this text before, but you know, I have only used it when congregations have made the very difficult decision to close. You've probably heard these stories they're mostly churches that were started many years ago when church was at the center of the culture. They have huge buildings and now very small and aging memberships. Well, they've closed for many reasons. They were never able to adjust to the changing realities of their neighborhood or the culture. Maybe they didn't invite people in or they were too focused internally or they were afraid to proclaim a new vision, or so many things come into play in these situations. It's often no one thing, and in the end, it's no one's fault. The remaining members can tell you stories of when the pews were packed and halls were filled with children, and they long for those days to come again. They never imagined this could happen to their church. They have looked and looked and prayed for that silver bullet that doesn't exist that would make their church great again. So they have finally made the difficult and painful decision to close. And I am there on their last Sunday of worship to celebrate who they have been as a beloved community of faith over the years, to offer words of thanksgiving for the lives that have been touched and to remind them that their ministry lives on through the lives of those who have been shaped by their ministry. I am there to offer words of comfort and reassurance that there are places waiting to welcome them, because that is what we do as the church. We welcome others into our community who are seeking a new church home. My role is to walk that difficult line of reassurance about the future, without dismissing the past and without ignoring or in any way diminishing the very real sense of loss of what has been a part of their lives for so very long. And on the surface, at least, the words of Ecclesiastes brings that balance of comfort and reassurance. For everything, there is a season a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh. For the church that is closing, it's just time. No one's fault. Everything has a lifespan, nothing lasts forever. Life changes, so no pointing of fingers or recriminations. Celebrate what has been. Give thanks for everything there is a season. And at the end of a congregation's life, this works because it is true. So you might ask, why am I using this text here today? You are so far from this situation I just described. There is no aging building with few members. You are not just holding on as a congregation or barely making it. You are far from that. And yet, there are some similarities. I probably don't need to spell them out. You get it. Lori obliquely referred to them in her sermon last week. I listened to that. But one thing I am known for, and that is my bluntness. <laughs> no reading between the lines required with me. I like to actually name the elephant in the room. So let me say it out loud. 
The similarity between a closing congregation and Mayflower is endings. Robin's physical tenure as pastor here is over. He is gone. And many of you are experiencing a deep sense of loss, both personal and corporate. I felt that as I sat in worship with you two weeks ago. You are experiencing what all congregations experience when their pastor leaves. And it may be compounded because it happened with such short notice. You weren't prepared or ready to say goodbye. I am a member of Plymouth Church in Lawrence, Kansas. Conference ministers have churches too, you know. Plymouth is the largest UCC church in the conference, 1,200 members. Peter Lucky had served as pastor for 24 years when he retired June 1st last year. We loved, we love Peter. Just as you love Robin, and Peter too had a wonderful ministry at Plymouth. So I know from my own congregation what you are experiencing. As Robin recounted the unlikely journey and incredible ministry you have had together over the last 35 years, I too gave thanks. But I also knew that just like a closed church, the time had come. It was time to give thanks, to celebrate, no recriminations, no pointing of fingers. For everything, there is a season. Robin's physical tenure at Mayflower has ended. His impact lives on. <laughs> Believe me, I know that you are on a journey and the season that a congregation and individuals experience of loss and grief varies. There is no set time, and it is different for everyone, and that's okay. As Lori said in her sermon last week, all of those feelings coexist, and they are held together with grace and care. And I respect that, and in an ideal situation, I would be here in Oklahoma as your conference minister and able to be in a series of conversations on a fairly regular basis about transition and loss. And I could walk you through that on several occasions when you were ready. But you're ready at different times. But I want to say a few words about that now because some people may be ready to hear some things and anxieties come along at different times. When I became conference minister here seven years ago, I learned a new saying that I hear is used in Oklahoma. It goes like this, this ain't my first rodeo. <laughs> I've been in leadership in the UCC, both national and conference, for as long as Robin was here. And I have served on local church search committees and resourced them for churches of all sizes. And last year, when Plymouth was searching for a new senior pastor, they were also searching for a new associate pastor. So I supported the search for that church, so they were doing a double search at the same time. And they called two exceptionally gifted pastors within a month of each other. And so I am sure they would be more than happy to share their experiences with you if you wish. Your situation here is very different, but my point is, my role here is to be with you throughout this process, to guide, support, resource, answer questions, advise, and suggest. The decisions belong, of course, to the council, the search committee, and the congregation, but you are not alone. That's part of our covenantal relationship, and what it means to be part of this body of Christ that is the Kansas-Oklahoma Conference. I and the other churches and pastors in this conference are on this journey with you. 
So, back to the text. On the surface, or at least the text that seemed and felt right for this morning, for everything there is a season. And in the ways that I have talked about it, this text fit. But as a layperson, I have learned to be a bit worried about much loved text because they probably aren't quite as simple as I was taught in my African American Baptist church. There wasn't a lot of conversation about Mar Marcus Borg where I grew up. <laughs> so here are just two reflections I have about this text on Martin Luther King weekend. One is specifically for you as a congregation, Mayflower. For everything, there is a season a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to break down, a time to build up. The author of the text writes as if we have the luxury of living our lives focused on one season. It's not as if you can mourn and just mourn with nothing else calling your attention away from that. He, and yes, I am sure the author of the text is a, was a he, obviously didn't live in the days of the 24-hour cable news cycle, where we are constantly bombarded with external stimuli, where the needs of the world, world are so incredibly overwhelming that sometimes we have to force ourselves not to turn away because it is just too painful or maybe overwhelming. We don't have the luxury of focusing on just one season of life at a time. And honestly, Mayflower, I really get the importance of living through a time of change and making space for transition in the life of a congregation. But people out there, People in the real world where you, do, where you do ministry, where you serve and meet the needs of the broken and hurt, they can't wait. They still need you. They don't really care that your heart might be broken because your pastor is gone. In fact, you know what they will say, callous as they are? They will say, he retired, he didn't die. Unlike Lori, they will say, buck up, buttercup. <laughs> there are children still being housed in camps. And out of 50 states, Oklahoma is still ranked 47th in healthcare, 39th in education, 34th in economy, 25th in opportunity with 15.8% poverty rate, which is higher than the national average, a household income lower than the national average, and is number 43 in the country overall when looking at 17 metrics. The needs of the world won't wait, no matter what season we are in, personally or corporately. And finally, this Martin Luther King weekend, you knew I had to come back to that, didn't you? It's part of who I am. For everything, there is a season. I don't know about you, but I am ready for a season where it isn't acceptable to tell Congresswomen to go back to where they came from and call it patriotism <laughs> rather than racism. I am ready for a season when I don't have to worry if my sons are stopped that they might be hurt because a police officer thinks they look scary. I am ready for a season when even I don't feel scared driving home on the back roads of Kansas. I am ready for a season when someone in one of our churches doesn't say to me, you know, you're not just a token, just a token. You're really good. <laughs> you know, last fall, 
Lori and I were asked to lead a conversation for a group of mostly retired pastors as they prepared for a tour of the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. Anyone been there? It's the national, they call it the shorthand, is the lynching museum. Has anyone been there? Anyone else been there? It's quite an experience. First, there is this museum that shows the connection between slavery and mass incarceration of African Americans, most, mostly men. And I don't know how anyone can walk away and deny the systemic connections that are both intentional and continuing. And then there is the lynching memorial itself. Did you know that outside southern states, Oklahoma had more lynchings than any other state? As Lori and I prepared for our presentation and conversations, we talked about race from our different experiences. While we were right there, really together in our commitments, our experiences and histories around race are so different, as you might expect. Our ages, she's from Oklahoma. I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. And as well as we have known each other, we have never had a conversation about race. And this is two people who are pretty comfortable talking about race. And we realize that generally, as people of faith, as churches, we don't talk about race. And I think we don't do it because it makes us uncomfortable. As a country, we are about to once again enter into a presidential campaign. Our current president is both abusive and ignorant about race. And we know he is not above using race to stoke the political fires to his advantage. Now I assume, perhaps, I assume that members here are intolerant of racism, at least blatant racism. But I don't assume that there is a depth of understanding or willingness to explore the deeper issues of race that sustain our structure of power and white privilege. I wonder what it means to be a church whose founding pastor was a member of the John Birch Society. And believe me, I know you have come a very long way to be open and affirming and deeply committed to justice. After all, I am in your pulpit this morning. But like my own church in Lawrence, Kansas, I have also noticed you, Mayflower, are very, very white. And I can't help but ask, what is the relationship of Mayflower with communities of color in Oklahoma City. And when have you had that kind of conversation? I suspect that that's not an easy or popular question to ask. But I also think you are a congregation that is accustomed to asking itself tough questions. You didn't become open and affirming 20 years ago, our sanctuary church by staying away from the tough questions. I believe you can indeed lean into the que tough questions. And I can't be here on Martin Luther King Sunday and not ask you that tough question. There is a price for me being here this Sunday. <laughs> Lori walking. <laughs> So Mayflower, yes, you are in a season of endings, of letting go, of transition, of giving, of grieving, of transition, of change, and of expectation. And you are also still the church. 
that you have called to be, have been called to be in this community and have been for the last 35 years. A church committed to justice in the world and on this Martin Luther King Sunday and beyond. And you know what? You honor, you honor the past leadership by how you will be into the future. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.